Well, uh, Rupak, thank you so much for helping with my project. I, can you say a little bit about yourself? Yeah, sure. Uh, my name is Rupa Ganguly, and uh, I'm a solution architect, uh, and and um, basically help companies, um, you know, take their applications and modernize them. Um, uh, as far as hobbies go, love reading books, listening to music, mostly, you know, Indian classical music, um, and just spend time with the family. And oh, play tennis. Yeah, I'm a big tennis fan. Oh, that's uh, that's awesome. How long? How often do you play? Uh, well, before COVID, um, used to play at least uh, two two days a week. And then um, in Atlanta, I live in Atlanta, and uh, Atlanta has a, a tennis league. So I usually uh, play in the fall and in the summer or the spring. So twice a year there is a league, and it goes for about. 10 weeks or seven weeks and then play twice, uh, twice a week. I, I mean, tennis is one of those few sports that's actually COVID safe. Uh, <laughs> assuming you don't hang out with the people on the bench or anything. Right. Well, yeah, to be honest, that was the fun part about playing tennis was the whole social thing. So I haven't yet, um, ventured it back into the tennis yet but yeah, hopefully soon what do you uh, like to read um pretty much everything i love fiction um love dan brown um like mysteries um agatha christie um whenever i don't have anything to read i would like to uh, read poetry um Lately, I've been uh, reading, and I was, we were talking earlier, right? Um, lately, I've been into a um, lot of financial literacy, especially for my kids, because my, my oldest son is going to college, so I thought this is the right time. Nobody taught me. Um, it's funny that, you know, the school system doesn't teach anything about financial literacy. So I've been into it a little bit. Um, so I've been reading uh, Tony Robbins. Um, a bunch of stuff, I mean, you know, here and there. But on space, uh, not really space space, but on the whole physics and the cosmos, Carl Sagan, uh, Brian Green, I read a lot of them, um, and it's pretty intriguing. Uh, obviously, Stephen Hawking, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, um, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I've... Any uh, like space uh, mysteries that you've read? Like um, I was thinking, you know, The Martian, the guy that wrote Andy Weir, who wrote uh, The Martian, also wrote this um, mystery that takes place on the moon called Artemis. Uh, right. I was wondering if you. No, I haven't. I mean, the only older science fiction um, was um, Isaac Asimov, you know, and he kind of, when I was young, when I read Asimov, it was like, oh, wow, did not know this was like pure fiction. And now some of those things have happened, right? <laughs> so it's pretty, he was pretty far ahead of his times. So, yeah. Yeah, it's a, I mean, even if you go back further to like H.G. Wells, who wrote oh, around like Wells, the right. 1900s, right. I mean, his yeah, description correct. of the Martian environment is like right. proven out by um, our probes and, and everything else. That's it's true. like very very close but it's kind of kind of funny is you know in 1900 there is no rockets like the concept of a rocket was right. like foreign so he has like the martians coming in a big gun you know right. uh being shot from there so it's, it's kind right. of funny how you have both like they really thought deeply but couldn't anticipate the technology right and 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 to that point um you know in in our in our hindu scriptures there are two scriptures mahabharat and uh, ramayan there are epics, supposedly epics, right? And um, these are fiction pretty much, uh, now that we know of. But it had concepts like that. And we grew up reading those, like rockets and mega nuclear. Now that we know nuclear, we can relate to it. But it was, they actually had those in there. And then these gods traveling through air in these chariots that somehow magically flew in the air, right? And, and these were written like 
way, way back, right? So it's funny that these references are there and I grew up with them and it's like very, very interesting, right? Yeah, I, I mean, it kind of goes to uh, one theory about where did civilization and humanity come from? And right. one thought is, uh, you know, maybe we're like the offshoot of some uh, existing civilization that maybe traveled through the space, right. uh, deposited some people here, and those people probably understood the technology perfectly and everything, but for some reason it was lost. And then like their children's children kind of right. saw the thing, you know, but didn't quite, you know, they pick up a brick and start uh, typing on it and talking, not right. quite understanding that a brick is different than a phone, but right. uh, exactly. kind of imagine. And you're right. I mean, you know, who knows there were civilizations that were there and that got wiped out just like dinosaurs, we just have enough um, evidence to know that di dinosaurs were here and they got wiped out. Maybe someday we'll find out about some of those relics and dig up and and then, um, you know, find evidence for some of that. Like, you know, there is, there is, uh, I mean, I'm not a really a, like a UFO kind of a guy or an alien kind of a guy, but I'm very interested in in, in both arguments as to see where the scientific thing, um, there are so many evidences across the world, like, like you know, the Mayan culture, the Aztecs, there's own in Indian culture that was there, th that got wiped out. There are so much of literature and, and knowledge that could not get passed on. So I always wonder, maybe we'll find it someday. Yeah. Or, or maybe even that technology developed here on Earth, you know, in some type of previous period. I mean, because if you look at technology today, it's, you know, roles are so specialized. So much of it happens right. um, in areas that are unseen to lots of people. And right. you can imagine kind of continuing further where it becomes more and more specialized. And then like something happens and like there's this one place where it's the only place they could do like maybe making semiconductors and right. like nobody else knows how to make no semiconductors. And then, you know, we stop having semiconductors and then, you know, we're not able to repair the technology we have and right. it goes away and, you know, we're back hunting uh, right. talking about stories about how we used to pick up bricks and talk on them. <laughs> right. That is true. Yeah, it's scary. It is scary. Yeah. I mean, sometimes I think about it. Like if we, if I keep my phone somewhere and forget about it, I go antsy. And like, just imagine when I was growing up, there was nothing like that. And you get used to technology or, or convenience so quickly. Right. So let's see. <laughs> um, but you're talking about financial literacy. I mean, right. that's something I've thought about uh, also. I mean, like the rich become richer and their children become richer because they do things differently as well right. as having a, a different starting point. And right. the poor stay poor because they continue. I mean, it's like, um, I think Einstein said, uh, like the eighth wonder of the world is compound interest. Exactly. Uh, those, those who understand it, earn it. And those who don't pay it. And that's Absolutely. pretty much like the, the difference between the two. And, and another great thing that I, uh, so I, I, we were talking about it, right? So everyone should own a business, I'm not saying that you should not work, but everyone should own a business because the, I, this is a funny thing that I heard and it's so true that um, employees first pay it a tax and then um, uh, get the money for themselves. Mm the corporates first pay themselves, then whatever is left over, they pay the tax. And it's yeah. so true. If you have ever done a, uh, any business, however small, big or large, you'll always see you first deduct the expenses and then you pay the tax. So, so and that's not possible if you only are on a W-2. You, oh, absolutely. You get money and you just pay tax, that's it. So it's, it's a lot, lot of small little things that, again, I'm talking about perfectly legal stuff, right? And, and I wonder, um, nobody teaches them in school. Um, if you are lucky that you bumped into a book or you bumped into some seminar or you talked to somebody who has done it before and shared that information with you, you get lucky. Otherwise, you're just going away, 
doing your W2s, right? And working and your mentality and all that. But that's what I kind of started doing with my kids. At least I said, well, you know, at least learn the basics. What's the 72 rule? What's the comp what's compound interest? We all learn compound interest, like in third grade, fourth grade. But that's about it. We learn the formulae, but they never tell us what is the real application of that compound interest. How does it really matter? So it's kind of funny, but yeah. I mean, I can go lens. I mean, I mean, even something simple as you get a mortgage, you get it at 3% right. per year, uh, you buy a $100,000 uh, home. Right. What's the total amount you're paying? Over the course of 30 years, it'd be 300,000. Absolutely. And, and no. people calculate that. But, and a funny thing, um, I've seen people would pay 16% to 22% uh, rate of interest on a credit card, right? Mm -hmm. but they would not agree to put their money in something that will make them 4%. Right. It's just it's such a stigma or I don't know, uh, ignorance or whatever you call it. People are paying 16% on their credit card by doing only minimum payment, but they don't understand if I pay off my credit card, whatever money I save, even if it's hundred bucks, if I put it into a 4% or a 6% investment vehicle, they'll probably make more money than they do today. It's just as simple as that, but. Well, exactly. So, I mean, it's, it's I think, another, another uh, topic for discussion, but I'm not trying to derail your. No, no, it's, it's very true. I mean, and, you know, largely what I'm kind of interested in by these conversations is thinking about the investments we make today and the results right. in the future. Right. Um, I mean, the financial piece is a way to really bring it down to numbers and things that you understand. You know, if you if you learn something today in terms of like you were saying about the compounding right. interest, you know, that pays you over and over. But and you were talking about the credit card. But I mean, how about like leases? You know, you decide right. to uh, lease an apartment and right. you're like, should I or a car? And you're <laughs> like, uh, should I should I sign up for the six month lease? But it's slightly higher. Are the twelve month lease was just slightly lower, and right. then you kind of look at things. Well, what if I had to break my lease in eight months? You know, I mean, right. like, what's the what's right. the cost of doing that? You know, and and right. and, and and I I looked at leasing cars and all lot uh, stuff like that, but the truth of the matter is, from a lot of friends, I found out that even if you kind of dent the car or you scratch the car, or it's not in the same condition after three years, they will take money off your. <laughs> thing and you have to pay back and then it doesn't sound as good as it sounded when you bought the new car on the lease right so there are a lot of catches and gotchas and everywhere right but one more thing i wanted to just point out was you said the richer kind of or the the rich kids inherit and become richer and start at a higher level and that's another thing that we think that inheritance is just that you write in a will and you kind of get away but how the parent use their money to build a legacy that can be passed on to their second generation is also a concept that is separate from just investing money for today for cash flow for today so that's two different things but it, if everyone kind of understands that okay have enough cash flow for when you retire and today but then also have the eye for keeping something build a legacy for the next generation, your kids would start off so much higher and so much comfortable, right? And do have the freedom, right? And they can take that money and they can invest and do something more. Um, I mean, my dad was, uh, I mean, I was fortunate enough that I, he raised me one level up. I'm just trying, I started from much way level higher up than my dad started. I'm trying to just bump the ladder a little bit more for my son so that he can be a little bit more like <laughs> comfortable right so <laughs> i remember you used to have a quote in your email signature that went something along like uh, there's two groups of people those who take credit right. and those who do the work right and uh the second group uh you know there's fewer of them less competition so exactly absolutely i will always believe in hard work but then i figured out like you know there is it has to be a a, a slice of smartness uh, which comes with discipline and, and kind of work ethic and all that. I mean, uh, uh, early wage worker probably works 
way more harder than any of us, right? Sure. But does he get the worth of money or comfort or happiness for that amount of work or hard work that he puts in is what kind of makes you smart, right? So I've, I've talked to my, I have a knack of talking about business. I'm a big, big believer that everybody should own a business, whatever they do. So the, my, my lawnmower guy, I've been using him for like last five years and he comes in, nice, very nice guy. Talk to him and I said, think about this. You're one guy. I've seen you work hard in summer, sweat pouring down and you make whatever money you make, you're a really uh, hard worker. Why don't you think of getting two more people, right? Let them do some of the work. I'm not saying you go and rest in the car, but delegate some of the work and then you focus on building the business. And believe it or not, today, he comes with five guys and he talks to people like me to generate more business. And his workers do the work because he would come and say, oh, you know what? I saw that your yard is not doing too well. Uh, you need, your bushes need to be cut. Can I do that? Can I add it to the thing? He's got that whole thing. And that's where I think the businessman is making, is doing the hard work, but really worth the value, right? And, and everybody should, I think, understand that. We are very hardworking. We all work hard. But is it worth the hard work? I mean, the time we take away from the family. That's what, another thing that I've been thinking lately. Like, yeah, you can do three jobs. You can do, you know, whatever and make a lot of money if you have um, that expertise. But is it worth the time? My kid's going to go to college very soon. <laughs> Am I going to get that time back? Probably not. So... Well, and okay. the other side of it is it something that y'all could do together? You know, it's right. like, um, and right. others, like, I think Ross Jimenez is like making right. um, kind of little wood items that he can sell. And, you know, right. maybe he's doing that with his family and it's kind his of like family, a family, right. And something that you interests you, it brings joy, um, is always something that you would do like a, you know, you can call it a side gig or whatever, start something. And then, you know, you don't have to get, uh, become a millionaire doing that. But Well, and you know, people will plop down a hundred thousand dollars to go to business school, Oh yeah. uh, you know, but then uh, right. they won't, uh, they won't invest anything in starting a business. You know, if they take that money and actually go in and run a business, 100%. I bet you they learned way more. hundred percent. So well said. Yeah. I mean, you know, they always, like I've, I've seen, I mean, I myself have done it. I've tried everything. So I have my consultancy, which is work from home. I've done, um, you know, my wife does a, a learning center, it's a franchise. So we have tried that model too. So you can pay a little bit of money, get the, get the name and the marketing and the infrastructure and the training and all that. And you can jumpstart your business. That works well too. But then, you know, the organic growth of something that you built and grow uh, has totally different uh, level of happiness and satisfaction, especially if you can do it with the family, like you said. And, and especially if something you can um, show and people understand what it is. I, I mean, right. yeah. uh, from the outside, all my work is just simply, uh, you know, clicking a mouse and it's all very virtual. And, you know, it's really interesting if you're into the nitty gritty, but if you're not, uh, it makes no yeah. sense whatsoever. No sense. Yeah. And that's why, I mean, you, you, you will find, I know you are a big geek, I am a big geek, but you'll find a very few people who are in IT, but they just work in IT because IT is the best work to make most money, hmm. right? I mean, hmm. amount of hard work, considering that, right? Um, but I, I actually speak um, at a workshop where there's a bunch of these IT folks, they're all like 45 and they're going through this crisis where they're saying, well, I can't grow anymore. I'm just bored to death because either I'm a manager or not that manager is a bad position or anything, but I don't have interest because I don't understand people. I don't want to manage people, but I just want that position because if I don't, they will kick me out because I'm not a tech anymore. So I have to be a manager or something like that. Right. And they're bored out of the mind. Should I learn AWS? Should I learn Azure? I'm like, what do you want to do? Tell me that. Maybe you don't want either. <laughs> Maybe you just want to do something else. 
but I guess, you know, um, those are things I think we, we kind of start thinking late in life. But I want to teach all of those things to my kids. We actually have open conversations and dinner table saying, you know what, what do you want to do? I mean, yeah, um, go study hard and, and get good grades. But at the same time, um, just, you know, walk the offbeat path and see what you can do. I mean, you know, I, I asked my son, I mean, he wants to do finance business and all that. He, he had a knack for it. I said, but you know what? Just do everything. Go and take a computer science class. Who knows? You might like that. Don't say no. Like we had a rule in our house. My dad used to have a rule in our house that if you have to say no to something to eat, like a vegetable or whatever, you have to at least try it five times <laughs> before you say no to it. By the end of the five days or whatever, five times, they, they don't detest it. They kind of, yeah, it's okay. I'll eat it. And they eat it, right? So just try stuff, try stuff out. I mean, you know, unless it's really risky, which most of the times it's not. Exactly. I mean, everything from maybe a new board game that you haven't tried to okay. eating new food like you're talking about, or, or maybe even going to uh, a, a country or a right. different country. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, yeah, that's, that's a practical life experience, right? Yeah, it definitely. And, you know, whenever you talk about uh, becoming financially uh, stable or, or well-to-do, and it, it's really about being able to transition from feeling like you have to trudge along to um, maybe this growth mode. Right. So. And, and, and indeed, it is, it is a long term. It's not a, none of this stuff is get rich quick thing. It's, so compound interest is a concept of a long term. It doesn't happen in a year or two. You know, yeah, of course you can put the money away. It's like 401k, but uh, it could be tax free. There are there are stuff like that, right? Uh, it doesn't have to be blocked out at certain age and all that stuff. But I mean, it has to be long term. So early those earlier you start, more time you have in your hands for the money to compound. And then usually if you put that money away early stages, you really don't need money. You know, you just need money for pizza and apartment or all that stuff, right? You're not married. You don't have kids. You don't have expenses. So you can save a little bit more money. By the time you get to 30, you have a chunk of money already compounding. By the time you're 40 and you have all these kids expenses and, you know, house and car and all that stuff, hopefully you have, you have progressed in your business or your uh, work and you're getting a little bit more salary so you can conceptually or theoretically speaking, save a little bit more money or at least the same, but you are growing that one, that piece of money that you don't have to touch hopefully. Right. And, and that, that 20, 30 years of investment long-term can make a difference of you having a million dollars in an investment vehicle at the age of, 65 and you retire than having a poorly managed 200k 401k hard-earned money uh, matched money um, going through the ups and downs of market like we do and lo losing a bunch of stuff and then having some some piddly amount um, at the age of 65 and um, and then paying tax on it then you take it out <laughs> So, um, yeah, and there's a lot of stuff. I'm just trying to teach my kids. And, I, 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 and it's funny that we're talking. And that's all I do. Whenever I meet somebody, I just talk about stuff. And some people like, eh, I know all that stuff. I am doing stuff. I'm like, okay, that's cool. <laughs> I've also learned to be very open-minded now. I don't get, get into arguments anymore. I guess it's just because I'm 50. I understand. People come from all walks of life. And you know what? I mean... <laughs> Yeah, there's uh, an expression I heard. It says, uh, work with the willing. Right. I don't need to chase after everybody. There's enough and people then, out there with the, with the 8 billion. You know, there's some people that aren't interested. That's fine. Move on. That's fine. Move on. And then, you know, from, from some of my other friends, I've, I've um, heard, like, uh, ask and you shall receive. So I've also started, and if you think about it, like, you know, if you think about monks and, and really, really popular or, um, you know, wise people, they talk less. There is a reason for that. <laughs> because they went through this phase where they, 
they were so exuberant of their knowledge that they wanted to spread it out and they got shut down by people who were like, oh, you know what, you think you know much and I don't want your advice. And, and then they finally figured out that, you know what, whoever comes and seeks the advice will get it. And that's, I've seen that. I mean, it's just so true. I just understand it now because I've been talking to people and they're like, ah, you know what, I know I'm doing stuff. And you know, like, okay, that works for me. <laughs> There's a, <laughs> there's a, a guy that once said, um, I'm not young enough to know everything. Right, right, exactly. There you go. Oh, man. Yeah. All right. Um, so, I guess, uh, did you know that NASA is planning to send people to the I moon in 2024? I did not know that. You know what? And, and I'm surprised I didn't know because... I do follow the SpaceX program and all of that. I'm like big fan. I mean, not like religiously, but on Twitter I would see and I would watch the, I did watch the, the launch and everything, but I did not. I thought, you know, NASA was done. NASA didn't get funding and it was done and they're not doing anything anymore. But um, yeah, tell me. <laughs> yeah, uh, so, um, you know, the space shuttle retired in 2011. Right. Uh, since then, we've been using the Russians to send right, people. Exactly. And then, you know, through a program, we were able to get Boeing and SpaceX to create um, a privately owned and operated capsule where we just buy rides from them. Right. Um, SpaceX, incidentally, also has two other comp uh, companies that are customers. Um, Axiom Aerospace, which plans to own and operate its own space stations and it's going mm -hmm. to be doing something with um, Tom Cruise to film a movie in space. Oh, nice. He might go up there and um, Space Adventures, which takes people on right, I heard about that one, yeah. space type things. But um, anyway, so NASA was planning to go back to the moon in the 2028 timeframe. And, you know, everything that NASA does is like 10 years out, 10 years out. But even as each year passes, it's still 10 years out. It's like a mirage. Out, right? It's always, you know. It's like our project, right? <laughs> oh, I know. I know. Like an IT project, you know. IT project, right? It's like every time the file thing gets up to like 99% and stays there, like for more than it <laughs> took to get there. I'm like, ah, that's just like my status reports. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh man. Um, it always seems to be that one last thing that you. One right. more thing. One more thing. Um, right. but anyway, uh, Mike Pence, the vice president, um, had a meeting of the National Space Council last year, and he said, mm. you know, going in eight years is too long. We need to go in four years, and if we don't have the contractors to do it let's get new contractors you know let's make it happen and so they've been working on on doing that so right it's kinda, okay. kind of interesting one of the things they want to land the first woman on the moon um well that's the, nice they had landed 12 people uh, all white guys between 1969 and 1972 right and so uh, and then also using our international partners right um, and it doesn't, it means, the international partner part means that uh, the U.S. Uh, taxpayer may not pay for everything. Uh, you know, you might get a partner that says, hey, I want to send and have like the first Japanese astronaut on the moon. Right. And they're like, well, you know, if you could help fund this much, then we can make that happen, you know. So there's like some options there. It's right. Kinda... So tell me, that's interesting because is like NASA has been always been like using tax money, but then it's a government body. <clears throat> it does stuff, right? But are they opening up like SpaceX, for instance, right? It's a privately owned, they can give away equity for in lieu of investment. Is that something that NASA is thinking? Um, I don't think so. I, you know, NASA for the longest time has used like uh, governmental contractors like Boeing and Lockheed Martin right. and other things right. um, where they would define the requirements and, the contractor would come in and work on like cost plus contract. Right. Uh, so they still do that. They're building like this huge rocket called the Space Launch System, mm -hmm. and this Orion capsule, which is uh, the the rocket piece is being built by uh, Boeing, and the capsule is being built by um, Lockheed Martin. Mm -hmm. um, 
and so that's still there. And there's you know some key senators that are really behind that because I'm sure a lot of money uh, gets fed from that into their districts and and what right. have you. But in addition to that, uh, NASA is doing this fixed bid service procurement type thing. So you saw the commercial crew program with SpaceX, right. but they're also planning to land a whole bunch of uh, probes on the moon over the next 10 years. And they have 15 companies that have qualified to be part of this program. Mm -hmm. And every year they say, you know, we want to get this scientific instrument to this part of the moon. How much will it cost you? Or right. how much will it cost us? And uh, like next year, there's two companies that are landing probes on the moon. Um, uh, Intuitive Machines, based here in Houston, right. and Astrobotic, which is based in uh, Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. And Astrobotic um, has extra capacity on their uh, lander beyond what NASA uh, does. And they could do anything they want to with that because NASA is just buying the ride. And right. so they're doing this thing with DHL, where like mm -hmm. you and I can actually send something to the moon as part right. of their mission next year. Oh, nice. In like a DHL moon box. Oh, nice. So, cool. like uh, sending a quarter size thing is like about 450 bucks. Right. Um, so, you know, if you want to send like some type of token or trinket or right. what have you, you could, you can actually have it delivered on the moon next year. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Send a bunch of photographs. Uh, you could do that. Yeah. I, I wonder what it would uh, survive sort of like the radiation and the vacuum and the hot and cold. Yeah. Maybe send a USB drive. Or maybe that, that's even actually worse. Yeah, <laughs> that, I know. That can't even survive in my AC house. I know, that's true. The... That's not survive the, the travel, I think. Yeah, I know that's true. That's magnetic. Yeah. I, I'm having trouble getting that to survive in the ideal conditions. You know? <laughs> ideal conditions. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Oh, well. Yeah. No, that's interesting. I mean, you know, it's just, um, I sometimes wonder um what our kids would have um when they are like 40 50 which is another what 30 years 30 40 years it's amazing um the rate at which the technology is increasing especially you know medical and you know the life expectancy uh getting getting bigger and higher um 3d printing like prosthetic not only limbs but organs i mean that's gonna i mean and it's not far away i mean it's in the next five six years we will have something of those kind of being used in a more commercial way right i mean it still happens today but i think it's very specific and very very less numbers and just you know trials and and uh, very expensive but Things gonna happen very soon. So I'm um, just wondering what it would look like in 40 years, you know? Well, it may be kind of sad if it doesn't look much different because, you know- <laughs> That's true. Things, things only improve if people make them improve, right? That's true. I mean, consider your washer and dryer. Right, uh, or TV. Or TV, well, Think uh, about- before the LCD, there was 40 years when the TV didn't change. Yeah, you had the <laughs> big vacuum tubes. Right, exactly. You had like these humongous things that you can't even give away. You had to, right. you had to pay people to take it. To take it, yeah. right. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and they're so, so heavy. Uh, to, well, yeah. I mean, that's a good point. Um, segue to, you know, why would, like, so mother is a necessity of invention, right? So if there is no necessity, there has not been any invention or a need to change things. So unless there is something really drastic happening to the earth and we know it's, it's happening, um, travel to moon or, or somewhere else, like to colonize, um, it's not going to happen. I mean, people will be like, eh. people don't even vote. Forget about <laughs> signing up to go to space. I know we're all a bunch of cattle, you know, being herded yeah. from here to there. As long as we're fed and, you know, yeah, we're, fine. we're, yeah, we're fine. Give us good grass, you know. We're all good, right? Yeah. I mean, un unless something 
drastically happens that shatters our life. And most of the times it's too late to change by then. But then we go into depression and our life just goes away. But till that time, I think we are just so comfortable in our comfort zones. You know, like you said, like as long as we are fed and we have a good job and you know, whatever, right? So we're just happy. Who cares? <laughs> so. Of course, the other side of that is uh, don't, don't be upset when the butcher comes along to uh, right. you know, turn you into a whole bunch of, uh, you know, food for other people who right. are, are kind of, I mean, yeah. It's kind of, um, I, I heard somebody say uh, comfort kills. Uh, right, it does. It yeah. absolutely does. I, I, some point of time, I've kind of, in my career, I figured, well, if I get comfortable, one day I'll wake up and, and I'll get fired from my job and I wouldn't have a job because I wouldn't be able to even talk about or to somebody because I would be so outdated. So I made it a point to change my job every year. And as, as easy as it sounds, it's not because every time I look for a job, I'm very particular about one, working remote. I've been working 15 years remotely. One remote. And two, I wanted to do stuff that I really liked, not just take another job. Hmm. So it was, my, my target was so small <laughs> that I had to really work hard to find jobs, but I did. And it's all effort, right? I mean, if you get out of a comfort zone, um, there is nothing else but just move forward. It is, uh, so, I mean, yeah, people should, should kind of get out of their comfort zone a little bit and try things out would be whatever <laughs> right yeah and in, indeed uh, you know always be growing uh, don't always growing, yeah. yeah kind of keep pushing the boundaries but um but what do you think about space exploration i mean do you think it's like maybe a misplaced a misplaced priorities and we should really be using those energies for something else or or do you see it as like foundational to the future of humanity and you know, at some point, either we learn to use space, um, or do you see it as somewhere in between? Yeah, um, I would probably go with somewhere in between. Um, I definitely think that we def uh, we need to um, we need to allocate funds to fund those projects because um, exploration is thy my mankind. I mean, you know, if if the European explorers never ventured out and had the courage. We wouldn't have discovered half of the land we discovered, right? Um, if they wouldn't have ventured out. Um, so, I mean, if, like, if we don't do that, it's the same concept. If we don't get out of our, of our area that we know and we can't, don't explore, we would have not found out what we found out in the last what our 40, 50 years of space exploration. And maybe there is a lot more to be done. I mean, there is a lot more to be done. I mean, moon is just a thing. My, um, the challenge, and I've, I've been reading, uh, read a lot of science fiction and re, um, hear a lot of podcasts on the scientific stuff, like the challenges, like scientific challenges. So stuff like going to Mars, for instance, is so far that unless we, can travel at the close to the speed of light. Um, it's, a, it's a huge endeavor to get there and come back. Um, and then of course, theory of relativity where like if you travel too fast and you come back, you'll probably, you will not age, but like 40 years would have gone by in, in earth years, things like that. I mean, it's very interesting. I mean, it's, it's very interesting that we are actually talking about those things, not in books, but like in a chat because this, those things can happen, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, if we don't, if we don't generate enough need to go to Mars, we'll never invent a spacecraft that can do that, right? In that fashion, in a in a in a normal fashion. I mean, we had when when Ford started uh, before Ford built the engine, we had horse cart and it took you know whatever days to go and we couldn't even travel city to city but there was a need because he wanted 
people to communicate goods and all that. Trains were built like that and same with the cars and everything. And now we, we pick up our car and we can travel across the country, uh, spend six, seven, eight, ten, 10 days and go from coast to coast, right? There was a need for it. Um, and I mean, if, if you think about like 40, 60 years back, that was impossible. I mean, but somebody thought about it and said, you know, why not? Why, why is it not possible? And uh, I think we have to find that need. And that's why this question is very important um, because not if not enough people support that need, then it's not going to happen. You know, uh, just, I mean, just a few, I mean, visionaries are obviously required to see that vision and bring it to fruition. But if, if there is not enough interest in the mass, in, I don't know how, how far you can take it because this is for mankind. Like for instance, if Ford just invented the car or the engine and nobody bought the car and they just still use the horse cart, then it wouldn't make sense. But I think people just wait for things to be proven to make so that they can see the value and then they jump on it, right? So I think there are a lot of people who are just waiting. I mean, like, ah, oh, that's all science fiction. So we'll see. Right? Yeah, no, so, I mean, I think you're you're definitely right. I mean, I think that's true with, you know, people coming over to North America from Europe. Uh, you had like uh, just a handful of explorers and then you have a few like adventuring people. And then, yeah. you know, once it kind of got proven out, then you saw a kind of uh, more significant numbers come across. Right, right. And I mean, they started with cars and they couldn't go jump continent. So they, <clears throat> they built ships, they went across and then they found this is too slow. I mean, to come from, you know, East Asia to cross the whole Africa and then come back to, uh, to North America was, takes like so much time. And so they built airplanes and then um, the, one interesting thing is like, you know, before we go to space travel, there is still, I think, a little bit more work that can be done on aircraft itself. Right? Sure. Like, you know, the whole concept of the Concorde, where it could actually go supersonic and just cut travel in half. Um, maybe there is more to do on that, that side as well. I mean, you know, it takes, it takes 15 freaking hours to go from US to my to my country in India, maybe, I mean, of course it used to take longer and you used to stop for fueling and everything. Now there is at least a direct flight that can go 15 hours nonstop. Obviously we made um, progress, but then why not six hours, you know? Why not 30 minutes? Why not 30 minutes, right? Exactly. And if it, and if it was 30 minutes and it cost the uh, equivalent price of a first class ticket today, is that something you would be interested in? Absolutely, 100%. Because you know what? The time is money, right? I mean, I would save so much money. I mean, there are people who actually go for business to India, mm -hmm. 15 hours nonstop. They do a one hour meeting and they take the next flight back home. 15 hours back again, one hour meeting. And it wow. can't be done on Zoom. They have to be present, right? It's like 30 freaking hours and wasted health and time and all that for a one hour meeting. So yeah, I would, I would take first class or even more. And even corporates would actually fund that easily because if you can go 30 minutes, do a one hour, 30 minutes back, mm -hmm. that's huge. So, I mean, there is a lot of stuff that can be done even in the aircraft industry right now in what is more imaginable, I would say, right? But, but yeah. You, you mentioned you followed SpaceX. Uh, so what do you know about the Starship? I don't know anything about Starship. All I know about Starship is Star Trek. Yeah. Well, it used to be called um, uh, BFR, a big Falcon rocket. And then uh, as time below, before that, I think it was called the Inter Interplanetary Transportation System or something like that. Hmm. But anyway, one reason why rocket, um, uh, you know, space is so expensive is we throw away our vehicles after a single use. So you spend a hundred million dollars to build this thing, you use it one time. Now, every time you launch it, it's a hundred million dollars. And so SpaceX has been doing a reusability awesome. thing with like uh, reusing the first stage and then yeah. this, 
recent launch of the payload fairings, they were able to catch those and overuse them. Right. So the only expendable part is the second stage, which is, you know, like 10% of the vehicle. Right. In uh, Boca Chica, Texas, which is near Brownsville, uh -huh. SpaceX has a facility set up where they're building this huge rocket called the Starship. And it'll be 100% reusable. And it'll be the most powerful rocket ever built. It'll be able to carry 100 people to space at a time. But it'd be the cheapest per launch because you'll be able to reuse the entire thing. Right, right, right. Now, well, this, this vehicle, they're planning to use in many different ways from point to point earth travel. So they really are planning on like 30 minute uh, trips from like uh -huh. Houston to, you know, Mumbai or Tokyo or nice. New Zealand. That is um, cool. And they say they could be profitable based upon their initial estimates at the cost of an equivalent airline first class ticket. Um, so uh, that's, and they think they'll have it, have it happen like in the next 10 years, it'd be actually, I mean, they're building the thing now. And in Boca Chica, Texas, they're building a factory where they plan to be able to produce two of these a day, each of which would be able to do three flights per day. So just think about, and you go point to point on the earth, you go from earth to orbit, you go from Earth to the moon, Earth to Mars, all using the same vehicle. Wow, awesome. Yeah. And it's happening now. It's not PowerPoint. It's actual right. metal being well, I'm produced. Excited about, I'm excited about Earth, um, point to point in the Earth itself. I mean, you know, if, if I can get to, in my lifetime, get to go to moon, that would be awesome. Um, but even point to point, give me one second. Huh? One sure second. thing. I understand. That's great. So, yeah, I mean, I, I would, I mean, in my lifetime, if I can do 30 minute back and forth India, I think I, I'll be happy, to be honest mm -hmm. with you. I would have seen something, right? If I can get to the moon, awesome. But, right? you know, it kind of uh, makes you worry, though, like before this pandemic thing, right? Uh, people are only thinking about environment or what have you, but uh, you know, a sick person gets on one of these things and is around right. the world in 30 minutes. I mean, there's like literally no time to react. True. Well, yeah. Um, the, this pandemic has taught us a lot of things. How inept and how vulnerable the, the, the humans are, the whole civilization. Maybe something like that. Uh, erased some of the earlier civilization we don't know and it's so possible that you know um that we are so helpless and the fact being that we don't have a in the 40 years i think at least 40 years i think we don't have a um, hiv or a sars one or the mars one mars one um uh, vaccine there was a need this this time around because it was so brutal, then everything halted pretty much that around the world, and not only US, around the world, that everybody is working on a vaccine and hopefully it comes out and hopefully it works. But since the other three were not that prevalent and it only hit pockets and certain amount, certain people and certain countries or whatever, nobody had the need. Nobody had to put so much fund because they don't see the, it's at the end of the day, it's a balance sheet, right? You put some money in and you get return of investment. So not many companies thought it would be beneficial to put so much money in to build a vaccine and spend that kind of money on research and all that. I mean, right but, now that's... <laughs> I, I know, but, uh, you know, right now with like, uh, what, 160,000 deaths in the U.S. and a population of about 330 million people, you know. <clears throat> it's, it's really not that, that many, right? Right. And so it's really hard to justify that number is the kind of actions we've taken. Uh, but when you consider that how contagious the disease is and right. the fact that unlike, you know, um, SARS and MERS mm -hmm. and, and the flu, the, the people that are contagious are very sick and they know it. So they stay home. But I, I think the thing that makes this so dangerous is that you can be perfectly fine and, and be out spreading it. <laughs> spreading it. 
right? So yeah. you're looking at, you know, maybe whereas like the flu, what, 10% of the people get sick and then right. of them like 5% um, die, you yeah. know? Here you're looking at 90% get sick and 1% die. You know, it's just right. like yeah, hard to imagine. And 90% out of 90%, maybe 60% do, are asymptomatic. So they don't even know about it. They don't even sneeze or cough or whatever. Exactly. Just walking around spreading it, right? And that's why the kind of whole idea of that, oh, is it even true? I mean, is it just made up or whatever, right? And I get what they think, but but anyway. Uh, that's totally another discussion. <laughs> Do you know anybody that's gotten sick? Um, so not here, but uh, in India, yeah. And uh, in India, it is pretty bad. I mean, the one is, population is huge. And so my, my, my sister's in-laws, they live alone, they're older, <clears throat> um, 91 and 82 years old. Um, the the person, the guy, 91 years old, he got COVID and he suffered through it like 15, 15 days, but then he recovered. He was in actually good health. He didn't have any blood pressure or, or diabetes or any other thing, but he was old. He was 91 years old, but he recovered well. And the wife didn't even get it. Stays in the same room. I mean, asymptomatic. By the time they tested her, she was negative. They didn't do an antibody test on it, so we could tell if she had it or not, but I'm sure she did. I'm sure she did. But it's just funny. I mean, you know, um, there are cases like that where people recover and all that, but there are people that are dying. So it's just a hard choice. How do you know? So <laughs> I've not been going out. Yeah, me neither. I work from home. The cost of staying in has uh, gotten um, gotten even cheaper. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, coming back to your question. Yeah, it's this amazing world that we are living in, right? I mean, um, although like space travel is still a very distant thought, it doesn't it doesn't come around in everyday life. Like, like you know, air, air travel is like everyday life when it becomes like that. I mean, not only the cost part, but when there is a need to actually go to the moon, right? For some, some reason, like maybe they build a nice restaurant up there. You know, you save up for that vacation and you go up like, you know, after 10 years you save up and you just go to the moon to have a nice lavish dinner and you come back, right? That'll be cool. <laughs> Indeed. And, you know, I personally think the 2020s are going to be the space for like the 1990s for the internet. Right. I think in 2030, uh, we'll actually be, um, yeah, space will be an everyday thing. Um, right. Because right. you know that uh, Starship I was telling you about, mm -hmm. they're actually planning to do a test flight, a 150 meter hop of a prototype sometime this week. And, oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. And they're, um, you know, they're thinking that they may be able to make it to orbit by the end of the year or early next year. And so this is like something, I mean, I went to Boca Chica September of last year and there were just, you know, just a handful of buildings, like, like I think only one little building and now it's like an entire complex. I mean, they're like going gangbusters wow. and it's really amazing. That's cool. So, but uh, did you know that Jeff Bezos also has a space company? Right. I, I heard that lately. Yeah. 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 I don't know much, too much about it, but I read it somewhere. I can't remember now. But yeah, I do. I I do know, and then, and, and he should. I mean, he's um, he has so much wealth that he can use that to invest in something like that that can actually really push push the thing ahead, right? And same with um, uh, what's his name, Elon Musk. Elon Musk, right? Right. I mean, he's doing the right thing. I mean, he he changed the whole whole technology for cars, the whole um electric car which was like oh toy car yeah fine right you know and he just took it to the next level <laughs> the dang thing drives itself right so i mean um you need visionaries like that to kind of but the best part about elon musk was 
he is not only a visionary, but he actually can bring things um, realistically to practical use, right? Um, that's where I think um, the space thing has to be kind of get there and it's going to happen. But um, we're going the right direction because reusable and it's not going to cost us that much. But again, there's so many things like safety and everything, right? So I don't even, can't even comprehend any of that, right? The kind of training that an astronaut needs to go into moon today, you cannot expect that out of a common man, right? So that's where first question is like, what does it take to go to the moon? <laughs> yeah, you, you can build the fastest vehicle, the most efficient one, all of that stuff. But then what happens to the human being inside? <laughs> <laughs> is he gonna come back alive or no? Like, I hope so. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, what do you know about that part? About the safety piece? You know, I think uh, that's still to be proven out. Uh, definitely, you know, like the Challenger and the Apollo 1 and then the Columbia accidents, uh, those had really chilling effects on, on space. Right. By the same token, you know, if you look at um, people at sea or people coming to uh, North America in like the 16, 17, right. 1800s, uh, you know, death was a common occurrence. Right. And then like flying, how many, how many deaths have we had in the development of aviation? So right. um, we can't maintain this idea that it needs to be zero deaths, you know. Yeah, I mean, um, so security, like, uh, or safety, two part. So one is the obviously the safety of the the vehicle, the whole experience, and all that, right? That we get that part. Um, but then the the safety of a biological human being um, who's put into this situation where it's not, it's uncommon, where it's not natural, where and I'm talking about back and forth trips, if that happens ever, right? You know, back and forth trips, um, what that would look like, right? You know, um, people have been studying um, astro um, astronauts for a while after they come back from the space station and all that, when they spend like, you know, 12, 18 months there and they come back, they still are doing performing tests on start doing studies on them. Like, do they, do they lose bone mass or do they, do they change over time or whatever, right? Those are also the concerns um, that uh, will be a lot of apprehensions, right, for space travel. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of it's going to be, and also another thing is we've only sent people that are extremely healthy. Um, right. A lot yeah. of non, and extremely fit, you know, I mean. These and are, years of training. Imagine that. I mean, years of training, years yeah. and years of training. They're like soldiers, right? They, they, like, they can take care of whatever situation. But, um, you know, there have been some space tourists, right? Um, there have been, I think, about seven people that have paid uh, the Russians to take them to the International Space Station. Oh, really? I didn't know that. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, I mean, whenever the shuttle re retired, they had to stop it. But now that the you know, we have the SpaceX and the Boeing option. Uh, they're going to start selling uh, tickets again. Um, but, you know, those people did go and they, they got trained just like the cosmonauts. Uh, so I, I think they spent like, had some like three to six months in training. So it was intensive, you know. Right. If, you have, if, you have to, if you have to spend three months in training for a 30-minute flight, you've kind of not won. Yeah, as much as I want to do it, I would maybe I would do it just for the heck of it, like you know. But um, I don't know. It's like something like, oh, if you have to go um, <clears throat> uh, diving, then you get certified. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Right. Something like that. Yeah. Like if yeah. you want to do space travel, then you get certified. It maybe it will become um, something like that. I mean, instead of. Um, whatever, two weeks of diving certification, maybe you will do three months or six months of space exploration uh, certification. Yeah, I mean, if there is a need, there will be people who are willing to do it, right? 
Exactly. Yeah. yeah. That's that's true. But so you're saying if it was safe and affordable, you would go to space. I would. Absolutely. Now, course, safety yeah. uh, is kind of hard to characterize, but one right. way to characterize it is uh, how many people would have to go ahead of you without an incident? Are we talking about 10 people, 100 people, a million people? Nah, I mean, that, I mean, if I keep a very open mind and a very scientific mind, um, yeah, we can look at ratios and historical data for a little while. Of course, I will wait. I will not be not be the first thousand people to go maybe but at some point of time everyone needs to get a, get comfortable like the people who are spacex or the vendor and the public all have to be comfortable enough just like airplanes i mean there are people like at, even today who are scared of um going in an airplane they don't feel safe not because it's it's pretty safe but whatever right they have they have heard about accidents and all that but that doesn't stop us from flying right but does it mean that it's always safe no i mean you know i mean it has to get to the to to that point a little bit i would say once it becomes commercial not um oh i have the money to kind of do this it becomes commercial where it's like, okay, you have a booking system and you book it and you pay some money for the worth of the trip or whatever. It's a system. That's where I think I will be comfortable. Um, but again, who knows, you know? <laughs> but I would love to go up and take a picture of the earth from the moon. That's a dream. Yeah. How awesome that would be, right? That would be. Um... Yeah, definitely. Um, and, and how cheap would it have to be? How affordable? Are we talking about like a year's worth of salary, something less than a year, something yeah. more than a year? Well, it has to be value for money. So that's how I, it's not the price. It's not the ticket price. It's about the value for money. Like we talked about, right? If it takes you 30 minutes to go to India and come back, would you pay a first class ticket? Yes, of course. Have I traveled first class uh, ever? No. Because I don't feel it's worth going from here to Dallas or to Texas or Houston in a first class. It's not worth because it's not a, the, the nicety of going into a business class doesn't affect me in that. I mean, if I get it, that's okay. It's a park. But if I can do two travels in that same cost, I would rather do that. But um, in this case, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Um, I'll just throw a number out. I mean, I don't know, 50K, 100K. Uh, I don't know if I'll have that kind of money when it hap happens. Hopefully I'll do. But for a lifetime, once safe travel back and forth moon, I think 100,000 is a good, good, good thing. I can do it. I think I can. I'll say, start saving up. <laughs> uh, do, you, uh, do you do any art? Uh, art? Oh, yeah, I do a lot of art. Oh, what do you do? I uh, just sketch. Okay. Um, yeah, just pencil sketch. I haven't done it for a while. I just pick up once in a while. I just, but I love to sketch. I, I did sketching a long time, but I haven't picked up. I have not done anything very recently. Have you heard of the Dear Moon project? Oh, no. Man, There's... I have to take notes. There's this Japanese billionaire that's paid uh, SpaceX to send himself and like, uh, I think seven to nine artists around the moon in 2023. Wow. Yeah. And so, um, you know, the idea is that artists would be able to communicate that experience in a, a much more emotional and uh, impactful way. And he, they're using artists in the broadest concept, including like your um, you know, people who draw and do like visual art as well as, um, you know, dancers and uh, photographers Musician. and musicians and musicians, yeah. and uh, even like uh, movie producers or uh, directors and, and stuff. So it'd be interesting be... to see who goes. Wow. That'll be interesting. 
Hmm. Well, um, is there anything else that you wanted to talk about that we didn't get to? No, I think we talked about a lot of stuff. I think you need to do some editing. Uh, I don't know how much is relevant in the the topic we started with, but it was very interesting. And I would love to chat with you on other stuff um, anytime. We'll, now that we are connected after I don't know how many years. But it was, it's a lot of fun. I think you're doing a... I think I always wanted to do something like this, but I never got... You know, I think going back to that thing we started with like you know if you just want to do something you just do it it doesn't matter what you are doing i mean not to an extent i mean it does matter what you're doing but not to an extent i mean we get caught up in things like oh this is better or this is not as good i can have a better idea right so i mean i think this is great i mean this is if nothing else just you get uh, in front of people and i heard strangers and you get to talk to them about something. It's just a topic, right? It's just a coffee to- table topic for discussion. It could be anything. It could be financial literacy for that matter. And I'm getting ideas now, right now. I can actually do the same thing with financial literacy and just figure out people saying, okay, what do you think? Not what do you know? That's very, people just stop and they just say, okay, he's attacking me. But what do you think financial literacy is? Or why do you think? Or maybe start with a question like, do you think schools should actually have a class for financial literacy? Like basic stuff. I mean, that's a good idea, actually. I, I'm liking it. Maybe I'll start it. <laughs> Who knows? I hope you do. I think that would be fantastic. You. And yeah. I'll start with you. And we'll start the first episode and we'll go over and talk about it again. And that's how we launch it, right? Maybe, yeah, why not? That's exactly. Exactly. You know, and we'll invite friends and, and family and, and other people, random people. And once COVID is over, like do coffee shop things and, you know, it'll be cool. Yeah. It's nice. Have you ever heard of uh, Money Mustache? No. Man. <laughs> <laughs> it's an interesting podcast. I think you might like it. Mustache. Okay. I'm going to read up on that too. <laughs> <laughs> oh man it was interesting but yeah i mean it was great i mean it was good catching up um obviously great talking about this thing and i love what you're doing i haven't yet perused through the whole the website but i will i want to catch some of the interviews the quirky ones and um yeah best of luck man and hope to see you someday i mean we 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 visited Houston, I think, a couple of years back. But of course, I mean, we were so strapped for time. We just, you know, we had to go to Austin and check out something else, I think. So we didn't stay in Houston that long. And we were staying at a friend's place in Sugarland. Where are you? Uh, you're still uh, up in um, the area? the um, Right, the right. Exactly. Right by uh, where the campus used to be. Yeah, 249, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, I can't. I can. Oh, talking about interviews, I interviewed Ross Simenes, so uh, I we got him. And I'm trying to think of some other people that I've interviewed that you know. Um, he's Pat the Cox. only. Hmm? Pat Cox. Haven't interviewed him yet, okay. uh, but uh, I, but with 1,600 plus interviews to go, I'm sure I'll. I, I'm sure he won't escape. <laughs> right. Oh, is it searchable? It is, yes. It's searchable, right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I only put I people's first it. name. I only put <laughs> people's first names on it because, um, you know, it's more about their views rather than sure. putting them on the spot and what have you. Yeah, right, right. Of course. So of course. it's kind of yeah. cool. But, but yeah, yeah if you go there and search for Ross, you can, you can find him. But okay, so you only put the first names? Only the first names, yeah. Yeah, that's cool. I mean, you're, you're recording video, so. Um, yeah. And, you know, just kind of, kind of that, you know, I did because with a stranger, I, I thought that would make them feel a little bit more comfortable. You know, oh, it's absolutely. like, oh, yeah, yeah. Sure. I agree. Yeah, so, well, uh, let me go ahead and stop the recording actually.